All right. Welcome, welcome, welcome to the Art and Science of Complex Sales. This is Paul Foley, your host, and I get to meet uh, today with one of the men I, I respect most in uh, the sales profession, an absolute dear friend, mentor, and all around great guy, James Rory. How are you doing today, James? Love that intro, Paul. I hope I can live up to it, man. Doing great. Thank you. <laughs> you. You live up to it by just being you. There is no... I appreciate that. Yeah, no, there is no uh, question about that. It, why don't you, do you mind taking a second and just giving a little bit, introduce yourself. You do a much better job. I know I, I gave that intro, but you do a much better job in introducing yourself than I could for you. So I appreciate it. Uh, well, I mean, I've been building sales teams and sales or organizations for 30 years. So first half of my career as an entrepreneur and enterprise sales rep, and uh, had a lot of success uh, with about part of about five different exits, two IPOs, and uh, over a 15 year period it was pretty remarkable. Didn't realize how lucky I was until uh, time passed. Uh, and then for the last 15 years, um, you know, focused on Florist Group, our current business, and you know, trying to find ways to extend what we've learned to other organizations. And that's been the real joy, right? Is trying to understand how to apply what you know works to unique situations in the various businesses that we work with. Yeah, and I, our first introduction, I don't know if we can remember all that way back, we kind of date us, but a while back when you helped me define a graphic that really set the stage for what sales is, and particularly it was what sales is it was in our business at the time. But mm -hmm. do you mind taking a second and answer the one common question I ask everybody? Right, because I'm talking to sales experts from all across the world, and it's fantastic. But define sales for me. Yeah, it's a it's a great question. I think a lot of folks get it wrong. Uh, <laughs> so the first thing that when you think about sales, the first thing you have to think about is that sales is a leadership competency. So there's no more important one line definition than that. If you want to add a second line to it, sales is an exchange of value. And if you combine those two, you have to think about this, right? It's about leading buyers and sellers to an exchange of value. Too often, uh, sales folks take a passive view of their role in the process. They allow their product to do most of the work and heavy lifting. And then they allow the rule of numbers, right, to help them become mediocre reps and maybe once in a while have a great standout year. But they're not really taking the lead and taking control of growth. Uh, you've got sales folks that complain about the economy, complain about their product, complain about pricing, complain about the competition, complain about their, their team members, and never really look in the mirror and think about what they can do differently. When you think about the definition, sales as a leadership competency, it puts the onus on the individual to take the lead and take control of their responsibility, but it also puts the onus on them to take control of the buying cycle and the relationship that they build with, with buyers. And you know, do it in a way, of course, we can talk about this as we continue, but you know that my leadership style of choice is servant leadership. Now, there are other forms of leadership out there, like the power leader. And uh, regretfully, I was that power leader my first 15 years of my career. And of course, I've uh, had the chance to look back and understand where that worked and where it didn't work. And now adapting and adopting servant leadership to sales, I understand that you know servant leadership is really, really creates leaders who have a who bring a natural growth potential to every organization. So, uh, servant leadership, its principles are you know drive growth, whereas power leadership creates transactions. But if you think about it, when a power leader gets done with a transaction, it's all, almost always harder to make the next sale. Right. But a servant leader, it's always easier to make the next sale. So, and this led us to the concept of becoming a growth multiplier. So, if you think about it, servant leadership and applying that to the model, we become growth multipliers for both ourselves and the buyer. Every next sale becomes easier. And then, what we see are that the outliers are the power leaders and the passive leaders, right? Two types of folks that depend on different means to get there, but they are less successful. And then of course the third kind uh or the sorry the fourth kind is the salesperson who really creates zero value, actually negative value, right? They're actually growing in the wrong direction. So they harm themselves as well as the buyer. 
And so we don't want to be, of course, we don't want to be that. There are a lot of folks out there that operate that way. We don't want, we want to resist the natural tendency to be a power leader or to be a passive leader. We want to focus on thinking about servant leadership in the context of building a sales organization, and driving growth. You said something there that's, um, that I think you take for granted, but I want to, I want to make sure we unpack a little bit. So this idea that it's harder for the power leader to get the next sale, right? Right. So contrast that with, let's dive into that definition a little bit more, power leader versus servant leader in a in a sales. And, and why does that enable? Like if I'm going to a salesperson saying, geez, buddy, I can help you grow. You sell as a power leader. Now let's look at servant leadership. What, what is the, what are the core differences? Yeah. So the easiest way to, to think about it is what kind of game are you playing, right? So we think about sales as a game of probability. And what we want to do is we want to think about, to optimize the probability of our success, there are lots of things we can do. But the first thing you have to think about is a mindset, the mindset you bring to the experience of leading a buying cycle or leading someone to change. And if you enter that relationship with a mindset of abundance, meaning it's possible for both parties to come out as winners, right? So for example, if you've got if you've got something to sell, your takeaway from that is growth from on your own side, right? You're going to receive money in this case, in a traditional sales environment, in exchange for whatever product or service package you're selling. The customer should also drive growth, even though they're giving you money, right? It's not a loss for them. They're gaining your product service. They should also be able to turn that into growth. So if I have an abundant mentality or abundant mindset, and I'm looking to achieve a relationship of cooperation and find a way that we can both grow from the transaction, then I am by default a growth multiplier, right? The, the one transaction can generate growth on both sides. And when you think about the relationships that we all value the most, they're the ones that both parties gain from. So you've got a one plus one equals three. That's the outcome of the servant leader application to sales. And being that growth multiplier becomes now a cultural imperative that impacts not just the sales rep, the entire sales team and the entire organization. Because if you think about it, we, we've both walked into manufacturing plants and businesses that have words like integrity on the walls. And that applies, to, generally that applies to everybody in the organization except for the sales team, right? They still use words like, hey, you know, we're going to war, we've got our battle cards and we're gonna get some pelts, right? We're gonna go, we're gonna go, <laughs> you know, bring mm-hmm. home the prey, right? And so we have this mentality that, that the customer is someone to be taken advantage of, right? And there are lots of degrees of that, but at the end of the day, what describes that mentality or that mindset is the instead of the instead of the mindset of the, of the servant leader, which is a they're playing a positive sum game, right? The one plus one equals three. The power leader and the passive leader play a zero sum game, where there is always a winner and there's always a loser. So the power leader believes that growth is a gamble. They approach sales from a scarcity perspective, and they they instead choose to dominate the other person, the other party. They believe it's a zero-sum game. I'm going to win, you're going to lose. And frankly, I know this, this framework really well because that's how I was in those first 15 years that I was an enterprise rep and an entrepreneur. I was raised with good core values, but I still saw sales is a way to feed my insecurity and a way to dominate and to win. And so the days that I won, I was great. The days that I lost, not so great. It reflected my self-esteem, right? Just kind of the way that sales folks sometimes are raised. Passive leaders, same thing. They take a more passive, and I'll use a word that I use often here that maybe can mean different things, but instead of dominate, they approach their scarcity mentality with the desire to seduce seduction, right? So what do I mean by that? They'll use things like low price or I'll over-serve you. It's a passive approach to to the zero-sum game. They don't feel like they can dominate, so they take a different approach. They'll cut costs, they'll over-deliver, they'll over-serve. Uh, and we've, so we know salespeople that are in both of these camps, right? Those, what do you do with sales folks like that? Well, what you do is you help them understand the value of identifying and becoming more aware of the insecurities that are driving the behavior, 
mm-hmm. and then help them turn those insecurities into benefits that allow them to adapt and adopt servant leadership. So every investment they make in a relationship now can pay many fold uh, throughout their career. We've had some awesome conversations on this before. It's the first time I thought about this, this tie in, but when you think about it is that the servant leader is truly, truly interdependent, right? They are interdependent. They're, they're at a place where they're, they're able to have that. You have to have independence, right? To be interdependence. You have to be able to stand on your own two feet and know that you can walk alongside somebody and they are truly, but if you look at the power and those submissive, there's a huge, huge, uh, dependence there it's either they depend on their identity and the winds to to give them that identity or they're depending on the seduction you call it and that's the first word time i've heard you use that but that's that's brilliant i love how you phrase that instead of thinking oh i can actually walk a path with a customer i think that's uh it's brilliant stuff james i let's dive into one key question you've worked with thousands of sales reps hundreds of companies across across that 15 years I want to dive into what differentiates companies, leaders, and sales managers, probably in that order, right? So what are you finding when you're out in market that truly differentiates a great sales culture and a great sales company? Yeah, you hit the nail on the head, right? So that word culture is going to play here. It's really difficult for a sales team to outperform the limitations of its manager right? Mm -hmm. It's also really hard for a a manager or a team to outperform the limitations of its company, right? So this this idea, you know, the the Italians, you know, have this phrase, right? The fish stinks from the head down, right? And there's there's, uh, references in the Godfather and everything else, right? And that's the idea. You have to, when you have something, when you've built something that's not working, or you're part of something that's not working, you can certainly look at the strategy that you've built and how it's being executed. But you have to first recognize that the ownership lies with the leadership. So the best sales organizations uh, or best sales-driven companies are companies that have established a functional growth culture. So you can think about, you can the first thing that we do in organizations is we do a growth culture health check. So we want to understand is this an organization that's driven by strong core values and absent of primarily absent of the insecurities that drive a lot of leaders right so a leader may be dominant because they're trying to make up for a perception that they are lacking in some way and that dominance can infect or affect an entire organization and that can affect how people are treated and how the customers are treated what is allowed to slide, what's not allowed to slide, the words we use, et cetera. And it really doesn't matter if you're a values-based company, if insecurity drives or motivates the behaviors of its leadership. But if you can be a values-based company and you can operate as a secure leader, right? We all have insecurities. The question is, do they become limiting beliefs that then impact how we behave? If we can not allow those insecurities to be served at work, then we can uh, we can show up at work as a functional leader, and we can build an organization now that's values driven, and uh, we're all operating from a se- place of security or or a sense of security, and we can build an organization now that can thrive. And in that context, you begin to understand that the relationship with the customer is one that should be cooperative, like you said, mm-hmm. right? This is a if we all approach the market with a from a sense of abundance and cooperation or interdependence, then we can operate in a way that's, uh, we can operate and play a game that's a positive sum game. Every interaction should create a multiple of value for everyone involved. And if it doesn't, right? If we think, for example, someone's gonna buy from us, for example, and we don't know why, mm-hmm. should, we really, should we really take that deal? I mean, a lot of organizations would say yes, but you know what ends up happening? You take that deal and you don't know why they bought, how much smarter does that make your marketing team? Does that really allow you to take that deal and do anything more with it other than just cash a check? What if you took time and instead of thinking about just taking the deal off the table without without extending the conversation, push the check back for a moment and just ask a couple of questions. You know what? I'd love to take your money right now. 
but I'd also like to better understand, you know, what your expectations are from this relationship. So I can make sure that once I take that check, I'm going to meet your expectations because you know, if someone's buying from you and you have no idea why there's a disconnect. So does the organization reinforce understanding that disconnect or or does the organization reinforce, take the deal? We'll worry about the consequences later. That establishes the kind of growth culture you're going to have. And that also establishes the types of managers you're going to bring on board, the kind of behavior you're going to allow, and the way that your customers are going to be treated and your employees. So the management or the leadership team level, right? And in terms of building the executive team level, yeah, executive team level. What are some of the types? I mean, you're you're in organizations doing this work every single day. So, what are the types of when we say insecurities? <laughs> what do you see that drive a negative culture? Well, we've actually built some science around this, and we have a an assessment called the IFQ, the Identity Fear Quotient. And what we've done through research and our own experiences, we, we've identified nine core fears or insecurities that every human being has, or, or I shouldn't say we, we, ha- we don't have them all necessarily, but we could have them all. And what we do is we assess leaders and people for what their dominant insecurity is. And once we understand that dominant insecurity or dominant insecurities, we then help them understand uh, where those insecurities may be affecting how they operate. So if you, uh, let's see, if you think about Uh, One example might be the fear of poor performance. So if I have a fear of poor performance, I may develop a self-limiting belief that um, denies that I have really much self-worth and so, and that I need approval from outside of myself. So if I have a, if I believe that I'm going to, that I deliver poor performance, I'm going to, I'm going to be seeking approval and I may end up not only devaluing the contributions I can bring to the table, but uh, the contributions my team can bring to the table, and I may overcompensate for this insecurity. And so it really doesn't allow me necessarily to to hear what my clients are talking about, ask the right questions. It just kind of keeps my focus on me and how I'm performing. And and if I give into that, then I'm always going to be underperforming the potential that my manager and the people around me see in me. I'm going to be underperforming the tools that I'm given. I won't be leveraging the skills that I'm given because my mindset will will trump all those things and bring me back to that you know that that basic level of uh, potential that I have and I can only really improve my potential until I recognize that that um, living belief understand the insecurity behind it and then work toward turning that insecurity into something positive so the little engine that could right if I'm going to be really highly simplify everything if I go into something thing, saying I can't and that you you, yeah. you won't right so and you won't and what's really interesting and I think a lot of people listening are, are going to uncover is that is just as prevalent at many leadership levels of a company that it is in terms of their man or their management or their their salespeople yeah. right it's um, at the core of everything think about this every one of us in our careers pretty much every one of us has received or taken a personality test. Mm-hmm. Right. Have you ever asked yourself, now that I know my personality, have you ever asked yourself why you're that way? Have you ever thought about what creates the personality that the test identified? It's the insecurities at the foundation of who you are. It's the ins- it's it's your it's the insecurity and it's and its ability to affect how you operate that produces the personality that people see. The personality that you use to interact with folks. Personality is important as a way of understanding and being understood in the context of a relationship. But if you want to improve how you perform, you have to go deeper and understand the why behind your personality. For example, my insecurity uh, is the fear of bad outcomes. So what drove me for 15 years to be a win at all cost, right? Uh, zero sum game, dominant or power leader in the context of of selling. I have lots of stories that I can tell that um, demonstrate how I was how I behaved. Stories I'm not proud of, but nonetheless they're there. 
as somebody who's afraid of of bad outcomes or my fear primary fear of bad outcomes that forces me or or that if i give into that insecurity and I allow that insecurity to define who i am i show up as somebody who has to be a perfectionist so i show up as somebody who pays a lot of attention to detail maybe spends too much time so and i'm also someone who won't tolerate that in the folks that upon whom i depend whether that's a client so if you think about it think, think about me committing to a goal to my my sales leader and then a client not being sure that they want to buy from me all of a sudden that client now is preventing me <laughs> from having the good outcome mm-hmm. you know i that's going to just elevate my desire to be more dominant it's going to elevate my desire to be more more um perfect in the way i execute so the stress level that i carry with me as a top performer and every every business that i joined in one way or one measure or another i was a top performer the stress that i carried with me to maintain that level of performance was profound and it wasn't until the end of the year one of my best years ever that 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 finally hit me in a physical way i just couldn't physically perform anymore because of all the stress that had built up over those 15 years so these observations can give us clues as to how we can better perform as individuals but they can also allow us to perform at a higher level for longer without the without the negative side effects that many of us who've been through it you know have experienced so we're talking about differentiated companies and if i'm going to sum up our last 5 6 minutes on that i mean differentiated companies are the ones that that will know their weakness as well as their strength and they'll they'll I don't want to say the word push through because that's that's not true but they identify they identify the weaknesses they identify the insecurities and they don't lead from those they know they're right. there they know they're there right. they say okay this is but I'm not going to I make a choice so it's not a push through it's am I right. hearing you say it's a choice to lead from a different spot yeah think about and so we we use the phrase you want to be the tree right okay and and think about in in the, the think about root trunk fruit in in the context of a tree the the root is the filter the root is the anchor the root determines the strength of the trunk and the quality of the fruit so think of your mindset or think of your insecurity or think of your better word identity as the root or the roots of that tree mm-hmm. and this applies to companies as well as in individuals so you want a secure identity managing those roots so that they filter and strengthen the tree filter the right nutrients and strengthen the tree and produce the best fruit if your roots are grounded in insecurity then that's what's going to end up being produced and so for an organization if a company has a leadership operating system that is grounded in a desire to build secure leaders meaning i'm not using carrot stick for example i'm not using carrot stick motivators to motivate folks that creates insecurity in my in my organization instead i'm focusing on our the, the team's desire a human being's desire for mastery autonomy purpose i'm leveraging those things in the context of a secure um environment to build leaders who operate from a place of sec- of security right they're secure leaders they're going to now reinforce the growth culture and by the way they're going to attract leaders who are just like them and i'm going to strengthen the tree right i'm going to strengthen the trunk and b- produce better fruit for my organization by uh, investing in uh, making sure that we're all operating from that place of security so secure let's, leaders let's jump a little bit cuz I see the connections here, right? We define sales yeah. as a leadership competency. We say it's uh and servant leadership is is you know the optimal growth multiplying leadership competency. To lead an organization, you need to be able to lead oneself, right? So I'm, I'm just right. trying to connect the dots. So and then to do that, the executive team needs to truly understand what is driving them and decide where to be driven from. Now, how do they take that? That's a great decision, right? It's an amazing decision. How do you take that and then actually say, okay, I see sales and leadership competency. 
I want to drive from place of security. How do you take that and help build differentiated salespeople? Like what, what, yeah. where do you go? Yeah, it's awesome. I mean, the beauty of the, the beauty of this is that it's all connected, right? So think about this, think about, think about leadership. One of the, one of the uh, tenets of servant leadership is that as a servant leader, and this is just an extent, we'll just continue the definition. So as a servant leader, I'm looking to serve shared goals. So think of this, everything that's born is born for growth. So at a high level, whether it's a corporation or a human being doesn't, or a tree doesn't matter, whatever's born is born for growth. So what I want to make sure I'm doing at a high, at the highest possible level as a servant leader is I want to serve shared goals for growth. And I also want to lead down a shared path to change. Growth is the mastery of change. So I'm going to serve shared goals for growth, and I'm going to lead people down a shared path to change. Now, the principle of servant leadership is that I'm I'm doing this with volunteers. So the difference between servant leadership and, for example, a power leader or a passive leader is that I'm not manipulating, right? I'm not coercing. I'm not using my authority to, you know, to influence your desire or your, your decision to follow me. I'm treating you as a volunteer. I'm earning the right to ask you to follow me. I'm earning the right to ask you for your commitment. How do I do that? The only way I can do this, there has to be shared value. I have to, so if, let's think of this as a salesperson. I have to learn to qualify you. Do you have a goal that I can help deliver? If so, then we have a shared goal. Now, I have to also know how to lead you down that shared path to change, meaning I'm going to manage the sales process or your buying cycle and lead you down a shared path to change. I'm going to walk alongside you to make sure that I can lead you to, to that growth that you seek. That's the mindset that I have when I meet a customer. Now, where do I get that as a salesperson? Mm -hmm. it, must, it can't be just trained. It has to be reinforced. Well, who's going to reinforce it? My manager has to reinforce that. How does my manager reinforce that? By treating me the same way. The manager now can't leverage the threat of me being fired. The manager can't say, hey, James, you committed to this. I'm going to hold you accountable. And he's going to basically pull out the, the stick and hit me with it, right? Or give me some consequence for not following through my commitment, right? Otherwise, he's going to, he's going to break the covenant that we have created. Right. Instead, he has to leverage accountability as a means of helping me understand what I can be doing better to improve myself. How do we use accountability to find the gaps and then work together to, to close those gaps? We are, by that definition now, pursuing that shared. We're, he's walking me along a, a shared path to a shared goal. He's serving me and by doing so serving himself the shared goal for growth for the sales team and leading me down a shared path to change he's walking alongside me to help me use the accountability to improve the way i sell to close those gaps so if he treats me that way i would be much more inclined to treat my clients that way if i managed right if i'm i if i managed with the with the carrot stick from a dominant salesperson or sales leader then i'm going to treat my clients the same way right? It's very, you've heard this before. It's very easy for a crappy sales manager to turn an A player into a B player or a C player. It's very easy for a, a terrible, a sales manager with bad best practices to infect and degrade the quality of his sales team, mm -hmm. his or her sales team. It's also very easy to, for the opposite to occur, provided, provided the potential is there in the team. Let me ask you, let me pre present you with a scenario and you tell me if this is uh, walking alongside somebody in, that, somebody in that way. So yeah, I remember early in my career as a manager, I had grown up in a couple of software companies where carrot stick was, was, was it. And I, I just thought there was a different way. So early in my career, we had a bunch of activity goals for people and mm -hmm. Well, acti activity goals, I, I thought activity is a wonderful thing. It, like it's absolutely <laughs> needed uh, for and the discipline all around that. I absolutely love, but it wasn't until I, I started thinking about that activity goal being for them, not for me, <laughs> that it really, <laughs> that it really made sense. So 
Right. You know, put together a spreadsheet that that broke out every single like the probability of what each and every dial, email, et cetera, added to their bottom line. Then I can relate that to directly what they wanted to do in life, right? What they want to do outside with their kids, right. with their families, and that type of stuff. And that was, uh, for me, that was a game changer. Is that the type of stuff that you're talking about? Yeah, I mean, that's that's really good. And, and you know, you have to think about mindset, the mindset of the individual, right? You could, you could, it, you could give me that logic. But if I'm a rep that hates making cold calls, if you're going to give me the logic and say, hey, James, uh, if you make 250 cold calls a day, you'll make a million bucks this year. I mean, the numbers prove it out. If my mindset says I hate cold calling and cold calling doesn't work, then you're selling, you're pitching the wrong guy. Yeah. Right. So there's two components. So the, we have to pay attention as leaders to two sides of the mindset. One is the insecurity, right? This idea, the flexible side. We can we can impact the insecurities that we bring to the table, and by virtue of training and a leadership operating system, we can not allow those insecurities to affect how we work. But we also have to think about role fit, right? How often do managers and CEOs and sales leaders and CROs assume that every salesperson is the same, right? All they're just the they're, they're just what you described. If I absolutely. I, it's like, hey, if you're if you're coin operated, this will make sense. Well, guess what, dude? I'm a human being. I'm more complex than just being coin operated. So if you hire me without telling me what's involved in the role, and you try and you sell me on this gig, and I find out, shit, this this is not me. You're going to be disappointed. If I take the job because I'm desperate, and I don't ask the tough questions because I just want a paycheck, then, then that's on me as well. So yeah. We got to have that insecurity taken care of. We also have to recognize that there is a, that we all approach work. We call it natural work style. We all have a natural work style. And guess what? That's fixed. That rarely changes. Uh, maybe in that, maybe in 1% of the population, does that ever change? We like to work in a certain way. And it's our manager's job to understand that about us and make sure they put us in a position to win. Right. Just because I can do something doesn't mean, I love doing it, then I'll be great at it. And I know you know this. It's just no. I, I think that's it's phenomenal. So, and and when we're talking about, I think that d- ties down into the question around what makes a great sales manager, right? So, and 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 truly understanding. Mm-hmm. You also answered a really good question uh, in terms of coaching that I was going to ask. In terms of how how do these sales managers coach? Yeah, coach to the maximum impact to drive leadership behaviors, because we're talking about differentiated salespeople as differentiated leaders. And right. so, what I heard you say is that there's really two sides to that coin, right? There's there's the flexible, there's the flexible, which we define as the insecurities or the the mindset that we can choose to change, and then there's the inflexible, which is this is the way I'm built and it's the way I'm thinking and and that type of stuff. Right? Did I hit that? Yeah, man. It's it, and we you can call it natural work style. Mm-hmm. You can also we also refer to both of them together as performance mindset. There right. Go. There's a there's a fixed and a flexible component of everyone's performance mindset. And so, and that's the root, baby. That happens at the root of every human being. And that's what's going to get you the trunk and the fruit. And so if we ignore that, if we ignore mindset, then all the skills in the world aren't going to help me. All the training in the world is not going to help me. And all the tools that help automate processes and make me more efficient and effective and aren't going to help me either because I'm going to, it's all going to be limited by the mindset I bring to the table. You find, here's, here's a question. Do you find, uh, what type of companies do you find embrace this the most? Is there like a, a certain segment of companies? Is there a certain, uh, target of companies that, that really seem to embrace this, this type yeah. of, uh, you know, thinking of sales, a leadership competency, diving in with them. Like, yeah. Who is that? Yeah, I, I'm glad you asked. Um, it's really easy to find CEOs, especially venture back companies. We we tend to specialize with working with venture back companies only because they present the biggest challenge. They want to grow the most in the fastest and shortest period of time. We have lots of clients outside of that realm, but when you think of growth minded CEOs, it's easy to find a growth minded CEO. Who's who wants money? Who's like their whole motivation 
Their core values all wrap around money, equity, life-changing experience. Boom. You know, that's just not enough, right? That's not enough to build a quote unquote values-based culture, a values-based organization. You have to understand your values have to be led by your people. So the best organizations for us to work with and that that embrace this are people are organizations that have people at the center of their values-based culture. Right. And, and so for any CEO who wants their people, yes, to do to do the job that they were hired to do, for sure. But they also want their people to become better human beings, become the human being that they want, achieve the goals in life, in life that they want, not just deliver the output that they're being paid to deliver. I want you to come to work and have fun, enjoy yourself. I want you to be uh, renewed and fulfilled by what you're doing. And so for leaders who who have that as a priority, this is perfect because it's totally it totally lines up. And by the way, we can show them how that how that mindset can produce an organization that multiplies growth, right? Too many people today think of the win-win concept or the uh, servant leader concept as a nice concept that just doesn't drive growth or doesn't apply in today's economy. You can have both. You absolutely can have both. It's just a matter of what you want at your core, what drives you as a human being. One of the things that sticks out to me about that is you, I don't think this is not altru. It's not like altruistic or idealistic or anything like that. It's it's actually proven to work really, really darn well to drive. I mean, it's remarkable. The, the, the concept yeah. is that you are you're building an organization in which everybody can lead, right? And that your some of your best leaders are the ones that are in front of the people that need the leadership the most, which becomes your customers, right? And they need that service. And they're the ultimate volunteers. Yeah. Right. If you right, I mean, think there's no greater challenge, right? A manager still has authority they can leverage over their over their team members. But a salesperson is going out into the market. They are looking to earn the right to ask a commitment from the ultimate volunteer, a client, even in the midst of competitors who are asking the who are asking that customer for the same commitment. So yeah, to operate in that world, it's very difficult. And it's so it's the ultimate application of this concept. And what we find is the reason it works, Paul, is because look, there are lots of companies out there that sell CRM, right? But there's only one company that has you. Too many sales organizations are built around the product differentiating the salesperson. When I'm belly to belly with a buyer or on the phone with a buyer, 80% of the differentiation that I achieve in that conversation has to come from me. It has to come from James or Paul, whoever's on that line. So yeah, I need the product to open the door, but operating as a servant leader creates differentiation for me as a human being and creates a relationship with that customer that cannot be broken, right? It allows me to create a relationship where, I'm, where I become the emotional favorite for that customer as well as the rational favorite. And immediately that client recognizes that they are not having conversations like this with any other salesperson from any other comp- competitor. So it is the ultimate, it produces the ultimate competitive advantage in a sales environment. I always, uh, and this is something I actually learned from you, I say, it, and I say it a lot, but I say the best question a salesperson can ever get, can ever ask, right? When you're in a position to, to truly just say, well, would you like my help with that? When you listen enough, when you understand enough, when you're in the moment enough, when you're able to sit enough in your own identity instead of your own insecurities, right? That allows you to get that information to truly ask and mean, can I help you with that? Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, I, I learned that directly from you. So I, I, time. <laughs> I appreciate that. Well, and think about it, man. It's it's our insecurity that makes those pregnant pauses, right? Those the quiet time and conversations uncomfortable. So we have to fill them, right? It's our insecurity that doesn't allow us to ask a question like that, that really engages a client. Instead, when we see a need, we just say, hey, I can help you with that. And, they, and we just pounce. And what we're not recognizing is that, is that we may be ready to sell, but the client's not ready to buy. So the other thing about servant leadership is it's the ultimate customer-centric approach to selling. 
you put, you're always putting the customer first because I, I, as a servant leader, have to serve a shared goal for growth. In order for me to serve that goal, I have to understand who you are, where you want to be. I have to ask questions. You're more important than I am. And by, by asking you those questions, I can qualify you to see whether or not you have a goal that I can actually help you with. So if you think about it, I should not have a pipeline of opportunities that are unlikely to close, right? The statistic today is somewhere between what 50 and 60% of a pipeline never closes. Why? Because we just bring all this crap into the pipe. That scarcity mentality wants us to fill the pipe because it makes us feel good. We're busy, Mm -hmm. right? But we don't really, we're not really building an efficient, high quality process, are we? So we attack the insecurity, leverage a skill set, leverage a sales model, like the wins model, leverage a sales model that allows us to operate as a servant leader. And man, you're golden. We haven't gotten into to wins, but I think we should at some point. And I, I I'm gonna I think we need to bring you back to get into that because no problem. What I what I really appreciate and how you've been able to to drive home what you believe differentiates top sales organizations, top sales managers, and top top sales people, and how that that is truly, I mean, really comes from the ability to lead and the ability to serve. And that's uh and to sit and be able to be aware of that in your own insecurity, right? So you can self-lead, so you can lead others. And right, exactly. You. If you know your insecurity, right, Paul, it makes you smarter yeah. about your clients' insecurity. So now I yeah. become a wizard at understanding, hey, where's the resistance coming from? If there, if there is resistance, I've done the work on myself. Maybe I can better understand my client and where they're coming from. It gives me a deeper skill set to relate to the people that I engage with. It is a true superpower, man. There's no doubt about it. Well, that is awesome. I can't thank you enough. And uh, James, how do people get in touch with you if they want to uh, learn more about this? Uh, check me out on LinkedIn, uh, James Rory's R-O-R-E-S. I'm probably the only one there or one of the only ones there. And uh, you can also visit us at uh, floristgroup.com, F-L-O-R-I-S-S group.com. Uh, thank you so much for the time and for being on the art and science of complex sales. I'm going to do a little rollout and uh, say thank you very much. And everybody have an absolute blessed day. And James, I will talk to you very soon. Thank you, my friend. <laughs>